All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining Just Foods 2021 um, CSA Forum Part 2. Um, and I would like to introduce Cheryl Durant. She is the board president for Just Food. Hi. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us again um, in Part 2 of our CSA Forum. Uh, we're going to continue um, along the same lines as we did the last time around CSAs, best practices, and how um, um, just food and um, CSA network can, you know, continue to build our partnership. And because at our last um, forum, a lot of folks were interested in EBTs as a form of expanding um, their customer base and probably in improving their revenue, we decided to invite um, Tahira Cook from the New York State Ag and Markets that will um, highlight the Fresh Connect um, and Food Box program that is a way for CSAs to access funding to um, actually bring CSA, bring, bring EBTs to their market. And um, we only have an hour, so I'm not gonna stay long. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Tahira Cook. Good evening, everyone. It's so great to see those of you that are on camera. Um, as Cheryl mentioned, my name is Tahira Cook. I am the program manager for New York State's Fresh Connect um, Food Box program. Um, so today I'm gonna go over our grant program and um, towards the end, if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, address them. So let me just get my PowerPoint up here and share my screen. All right, and also if you see me looking down, it's just that I'm glancing at some notes because there's a lot of information, so I don't want to forget. Um, but starting off, our Fresh Connect Food uh, Box program has the mission of making local produce available and accessible to SNAP eligible slash food insecure communities, um, while also providing nutrition education. So throughout this presentation, I'll get really specific about what we mean by SNAP eligible communities um, and also what you can do um, that's actually not really specific in terms of nutrition education. We accept all forms um, of nutrition education in this program. So we have three objectives. Uh, serve SNAP eligible customers. We want you to source and utilize local produce. I know I don't have a problem at all with this group and that, um, and also providing nutrition education. So the funding that's available is $10,000 for nonprofit organizations to run SNAP eligible food boxes, uh, farm shares, CSAs, and farm stands um, that serve low-income priority populations, as well as provide nutrition education, as I mentioned before. Um, so food boxes and farm shares, not really much different. It's just to um, be inclusive of the language that we hear folks calling um, the different models in which you obtain shares of produce. Um, and I'll get into those models throughout this slide as well. Um, it's important to note you can, um, this grant is offered on a reimbursement basis. And so you can claim as much as, as needed. So in the beginning, if you do need um, an advance upfront, this grant is eligible for a 25% advance um, to start where you don't have to um, you know, show any proof or provide any claims yet. And then following that, you will have to um, then conduct how you're doing your spending on a reimbursement basis. And like I said, you can claim as uh, much as you'd like. We don't really go by quarters or monthly, um, however uh, you would need to claim uh, due to your own financial circumstance. So uh, applicants who are eligible uh, must be a nonprofit organization with 501c3 status. If you are not a nonprofit, we will accept a fiscal sponsor um, that does have 501c3 uh, three status. Um, ineligible to this program are for-profit entities and um, individuals do not qualify. So the type of models that I'm talking about. All of the applicants who apply to this program must operate or intend to operate 
um, a food box or a farm share, right? That's where customers are purchasing an affordable share of local produce, um, typically sold at wholesale or your below traditional retail prices. Um, and these shares are sold one to two weeks prior to distribution. Um, so that's typically the model where folks are coming, signing up ahead of time, then coming back to uh, pay, taking payment at that time, then coming back the following week to pick up the produce um, that they uh, purchase. And then, you know, an ongoing model of that if the customer is interested in, in uh, purchasing again. The reason why we say one to two weeks prior to distribution in terms of the point of sale and the transaction of money being taken is because SNAP is can be accepted um, up to 14 days before the actual product is received to the SNAP customer. Um, so that's why we kind of say they can be sold one to two weeks ahead of time. Right, SNAP eligible CSAs, um, that is of course where customers are subscribing to several weekly shares um, from a harvest of a certain farm or group of farms. Um, within this model payments, uh, number one must be affordable how, and also broken up into weekly slash bi-weekly installments. Um, so the purchase is SNAP eligible. So I know this group knows more than anyone that typically with CSAs, you are subscribing to your shares of produce at the beginning of the season, and it's not really broken up. You're usually paying your amount ahead of time and you come every week to pick up. Um, there's no problem if you're doing that, but in order to make it SNAP eligible for your SNAP customers, um, you would have to allow them to pay more on that week to week or bi-weekly basis um, so that they could utilize their SNAP dollars in that way. They are not able to pay for several weekly shares um, upfront and ahead of time with their SNAP dollars. And then uh, you can do a not-for-profit farm stand, and that, of course, is which customers are purchasing fresh and local uh, produce from a farm stand uh, in their community. Um, what we also see in the program is that folks uh, do a combination of these. So they may be running some type of food box or SNAP eligible CSA and also doing some one-off sales on the side for a farm stand or doing some sales in which they are complementing uh, what's inside their box with additional um, items that they are selling on the side. So whether that be like honey, garlic, um, things of that nature, we have seen a combination with this, within the program and that is allowed, um, definitely. And so consistency is what's most important to us with this program and with these models. Um, we want customers to know that they can rely on your project and rely on your site um, to come get produce. Uh, projects uh, must operate for at least 12 weeks. And that could either be 12 weeks in terms of you doing a weekly distribution 12 times, or it could be 12 weeks where you're doing a biweekly distribution uh, six times. And so that's perfectly fine. Um, either or qualifies for the program. Uh, this year, we've had some differences. Usually, the contract with the state would be for a year. Um, however, we have shifted over to uh, the federal calendar. So now, all projects uh, within this program must wrap up by September 30th of 2021 to be on our federal cycle. And when I say wrap up, that means that all of your spending must be complete by September 30th, 2021 in order to be eligible for reimbursement for the work that has uh, taken place. Um, typically, we are looking for affordability, right? But pricing is up to you. Um, we've seen people get really creative with uh, some of the shares. So like maybe they'll have a smaller share for seniors um, and charge a lower price for that, or they'll do like a family size share. It just depends based on your customer base if you're interested in, in that food box or CSA kind of model. Um, it's important to note, and I'll get into that some more, that this grant does not cover the cost of food. Um, so customers either must pay, be using their SNAP or EDP, or if you are interested in providing food for free, um, must be utilizing other funds to cover that. We cannot um, cover the cost of food with this funding, unfortunately. So here's some criteria. The project site must be in New York State. Um, all Fresh Connect food box uh, projects must be able to accept uh, ADP and SNAP benefits. 
If you are not accepting right now, that is perfectly okay. Um, we just would like you to share a plan with us on how you plan to become um, EBP slash uh, SNAP capable uh, during the duration of your project. So if you do are not capable to accept uh, SNAP right now, excuse me, um, you can apply to the program. Let us know that you are not able to accept it at this point in time, um, but you can then submit your application and I'll get into the steps a little bit more. You can then submit your application to the USDA for um, your FNS number and things that you need to become SNAP capable. And what we can do in this moment is if you have a staff member that is working on at that time getting your SNAP certification and everything underway, we can still pay that person that you have on staff even before you start um, having EBP or SNAP at your market. Um, so that's one thing uh, that folks kind of take advantage of. So for example, if your market starts in June and you apply to the program uh, today and you get accepted, um, your employee or whoever you have in place that could be getting paid by this grant um, can begin their application process to begin to accept SNAP and EBP. Um, the project, once again, must operate for at least 12 weeks, uh, weekly or biweekly uh, pickup stands. And like I said, really looking for, within your proposal, um, consistency in terms of, you know, knowing that you're always typically at this site, customers know where to find you, customers know um, that you're available with the produce uh, to be sold. So when we say SNAP eligible communities, um, this really goes by um, locations where at least 30% of the population is SNAP eligible. You can do some research on that. Um, there's numerous places to find that, but uh, for example, you can utilize, um, what is it? Uh, sorry, I have the link right here. I don't wanna forget. Um, you can use like census data, there's New York City health index data, um, but there's multiple areas where you can find data points um, to understand, uh, you know, that information in terms of the SNAP eligible population within the community you are looking to serve. If you're in a region that does not uh, meet the 30%, you can also make the case and illustrate how your program will serve low income and SNAP eligible individuals and households. And what I have seen in the program is while um, there may folks are interested in setting up some type of food box or farm share or farm stand um, within a certain community, they may not be at the 30% of um, serving SNAP eligible customers, however, within their community and location, however, who they serve particularly, right? Like we're a senior center, we know that our demographic does not, you know, is within that, uh, are SNAP eligible customers and SNAP eligible customer base, um, then you can make the case for that in your um, in your proposal. Um, so if you just happen to be in a region that is not um, meeting that eligibility, it's okay if you could just illustrate if your customer base is meeting that eligibility. And then other ways to qualify are things like priority sites. So for example, a senior center, um, uh, natural occurring retiring communities, so North settlement houses, low income schools where more than 50% uh, of children are on free and reduced price lunch with clinics, community health centers. Um, the locations of the services must be an area, in an area or a site uh, where SNAP eligible clients frequent. So like I said, just to get clear on that, if you're not in the region that's hitting the 30%, but we're in a school or we are outside of a community health center um, or somewhere within the community where you're getting those who are kind of most marginalized and vulnerable, um, then you would definitely qualify and you can illustrate that in your application. So the other project criteria, uh, our first objective here, source and utilizing local produce. Um, this really doesn't pertain to this group. I know that you guys are probably sourcing, um, you have relationships with farmers already, um, but typically uh, if we get folks in the program that don't know kind of like where to start or how to get produce, 
of course, they can work with a local distributor aggregator, local farmer, uh, having your own farmer community garden, or you can do a combination of all of these. So if you grow some and you also source from a local farmer to kind of supplement and fill up your shares or boxes or get more items on your farm stand, that's perfectly fine. We're really just making sure um, that this, this produce is uh, local. Okay, and so our second kind of objective would be our nutrition education. And so it's a requirement of the program, so our coordinators must pr provide it. Um, this must include distribution of some USDA approved nutrition materials. Um, and so I have a supply budget uh, in house. And so I typically will order some of these required elements here, like the My Plate tip sheets or healthy low cost recipes. There's also a big catalog of them available online, which is, um, and it's free, so it's not um, really that hard um, to acquire, um, but must include some of those USDA materials. And then additional activities on top of that may be conducting healthy cooking demonstrations, um, of course, both in person and virtual at this time, creating and distributing recipes, uh, social media campaigns and activities. Um, so it is really a wide range, right? We have folks in the program that do, may dis, uh, actually do distribution door to door, especially uh, recently during COVID. Um, so they are really just leaving like recipe cards in terms of here's how to utilize some of the produce in your box, um, ranging to, like I said, folks doing full on cooking, uh, healthy cooking demonstrations, um, virtually at this point. So whatever uh, you've kind of been doing or you think applies um, most to the demographic and the community that you serve um, in terms of how nutrition education can resonate, uh, then, you know, we're pretty much okay with it. We just need you to explain kind of your plans for it. So eligible costs for this grant include staff, uh, salary and stipends, administrative costs needed to execute these uh, grants, um, marketing and promotional costs that also includes printing of materials. So if you're printing like promotional items, marketing items, you can definitely include that within your budget. Um, rent for a site location. This is also a big one that we see within the program. Um, that includes like if you need to rent or you're utilizing like a community space within um, the area in which you're serving folks, uh, you can utilize some of this funding to uh, pay for rent for that. Nutrition education material, so anything that you need to conduct uh, the nutrition education that you're doing. Um, any additional supplies, so bags, price tags, items needed for cooking demos. Um, equipment, so that's tables, tents, um, anything that number one applies directly to the project, and number two is not really um, establishing or building out infrastructure. Um, whenever we kind of submit a proposal up around that, um, the federal folks kind of get really leery in terms of that. So if it's like, hey, we need, um, you know, a table and a tent to uh, really function this this season because we're on the sidewalk or we're right here, that's perfectly fine. But it gets a little tricky when we go into like, hey, we need a shed or we need a refrigerator or something like that. So just be aware of some of that, but I can definitely if you have questions around equipment, kind of troubleshoot with you because I'm also kind of getting familiar with what they accept myself. Ineligible cost, so what's not accepted, we do not, uh, this grant, unfortunately, due to federal restrictions, cannot cover the cost of your SNAP and EBT hardware and any of fees associated with the cost of equipment. So because this funding is a federal fund um, from SNAP Ed, they unfortunately do not cover that. I will share at the end of this slide some of the costs um, that can be um, accrued for getting this set up. However, as I mentioned before, we can uh, cover the cost of your staff person that is working on that. Um, we cannot cover any cost of food, as I mentioned before. Um, indirect costs, if you are saying like indirect costs related to the management of the grant or something like that, 
You just cannot say indirect costs on the budget. I cannot have that word on the application at all. However, if you're saying, you know, this entity or this person is providing management support, administrative support, just kind of list it out in terms of what you mean by indirect and we'll see if we can um, approve it or not. However, um, this grant cannot have the word indirect, application cannot have the word indirect around it due to federal constraints. Um, and of course, any costs associated with uh, preparing an application and costs occurred prior to the awarding of this funding cannot be covered. So here is some of the resources I have, and I will share this PowerPoint um, with you all so that um, you will be able to do some of your own research and see what works best for you. Um, so registering with the USDA to obtain your FNS number, that is, does not have a cost tied to it, but it is a pain. Um, I would just be honest about it, and it takes some time to get done, but the folks who do spend the time to get it done actually, you know, determine it really worth it. It doesn't really take much to renew or uh, have to renew your FNS number. Once you have it, you're pretty much good. Um, it could take up to six weeks to the application to get your FNS number can take up to six weeks to obtain from the USDA. Um, purchasing your EBT reader and equipment, uh, that can all be found on this website here, Total Pay, um, that used to be known as uh, Novadia. Uh, this is the new kind of area where you can find it. Some of the fees around that are listed here um, below. And it's important to note that when you're uh, buying the reader equipment that it does not include the device that would be needed. So if you're like going to utilize like a card reader, um, it would have to be attached to some type of mobile device. So whether it be a cell phone, whether it be an iPad or something like that, that is not included in what they offer. They just offer the card reader, the printer, and then the app necessary to um, run and accept these things. So this is something to keep in mind, um, you know, as you're moving through the process. I am not an expert on this. I can say though, if you do apply for the program, we do have some targeted technical assistance to help folks um, get set up with their EBT and, and acquire their SNAP equipment. And so in addition to that, you will have to get in contact with us as, as the state. And so I just let people know some of this ahead of time because um, a lot of times folks may get an award letter and think like, okay, great, you know, now I can get these funds from the state. But there are just multiple documents to be aware of that we will need to see when we're getting in contact with you. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with Grants Gateway. Um, it's a registration uh, and pre-qualification process you have to have to get funding from anyone in the state, um, not just ag and markets. Um, so it's important, you can get started on that today, even if you're not interested in this grant, um, but interested in future state opportunities, it's great to kind of be set up within that because um, that's always the first step that folks are gonna look at when they're looking to give you any type of funding. Um, we need some proof of workers' compensation insurance, proof of, proof of disability insurance, or exemption from both. Um, and here are the forms of the workers' comp and disability insurance that we accept here. And like I said before, I will send um, this out so you can have it for your records as well. And so for reporting, project sites must complete quarterly reports. Um, and then there's one narrative style final report that is required when you are uh, submitting for like your final amount of funding. And so quarterly reports are very easy. Um, let me see if I can actually pull up the report really quickly here. Um, they're very easy and um, they typically are just asking questions around your uh, nutrition education. So we want to know what um, type of activities you're doing, how many people are coming. Um, we wanna know if you're partnering with other folks on it. Uh, just give me one second here, I'm gonna pull it up. Uh, 
Okay, can folks see that? I'll just look for some head nods. Um, so for your full box reporting, it's like I said, typically very easy. We require this every quarter that you're in contract with us. Um, we want to know, uh, you know, what your distribution day and week is, because like I said, we really want to focus on that consistency. What are you operating? Where is your food box at? Um, how would you categorize this? This has really been made to mimic what we have to report to the federal um, our federal partners. So we're trying to keep it as easy as possible for all of you. Um, so these questions, like I said, are just required for our federal partners. Um, so either total pounds of produce sold this reporting period. Um, if you're doing a, a share, how much are you charging? Um, total number of individuals who are purchasing? Um, where are you sourcing from? things like that. So a lot of stuff that's going into your application, however, it could change throughout, right? Like you could start the beginning of the season sourcing from someone, that relationship didn't work out. So now you're working with someone else that could change over the quarter. So we want to see some, some of that. Um, we want to know if you're not accepting, you know, SNAP EBT, what are your challenges, um, your sales, things like that. So it's a very straightforward uh, report. So of course, nutrition education, we wanna know the topics that you're uh, speaking on, um, how many you're hosting, what channels you're using to communicate with folks. If you're sharing via social media, how many people are you sharing with? Um, so it's very basic, straightforward. Um, these are new questions this year, but I think our federal partners are really interested in understanding that beyond this investment um, that they're making, are you working with any other folks, um, you know, that aren't paid by this grant? So for example, if you partner with a college or university that is going to do some advertising for you or going to put together some materials for you, you can check that off and then vice versa. Um, it'll ask you what type of institutions are receiving help from. If you're providing any assistance to any folks, but you're not paid for it, whether you're offering any of these services. We just want to know if it's related to the project. Um, and any other forms of nutrition assistance that you're able to accept. Um, and it's really just very straightforward. So it's a 27 question uh, document that is, um, Sorry, I'm just trying to get to my other screen. It's a 27 uh, question document that you will complete every quarter. Um, so that's very simple. I try to keep it as basic as possible. And then towards the end of the report as of the grant, when you're ready to like close out completely, we will need some form of a narrative where you're sharing some of the grant accomplishments. Um, you're sharing any kind of plans for sustainability and things of that nature. So that's all I have. I know it was a lot. Um, so I would love to take any questions um, that folks may have. And my contact information is up on the screen here. And folks, you should be able to unmute yourself. Feel free to go ahead or if you'd rather raise your hand or just type in the chat, that's also totally fine. Um, we can read from there. And yes, um, to hear a mentioned she would share this with us and we will share this with you folks um, who are here and you'll get the, a copy of the presentation mm -hmm. sooner rather than later. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a question here from Roy. Um, mm -hmm. Here it says, how can SNAP recipients participate in the CSA if the farmer wants the full cost upfront? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like I said, that is very challenging. Um, it would have to be that the farmer is willing to work with a group of customers in order to pay on that kind of weekly basis. So sometimes what happens too is that folks um, will subscribe to, um, you know, a certain amount of shares um, depending on the nonprofit that is holding the CSA. And then the, the farmer will bring um, a few extra shares based off of some type of list or sign up ahead of time. Um, so for example, you know, if you are at a CSA site and you know for sure every week I got 100 customers, I got a solid, you know, 20 folks that are, that work 
on, you know, using Snap dollars. Um, and I have their signups and I've also, you know, am able to swipe a transaction or something like that ahead of time. Even before you come, you can do it in that way. But that definitely is, um, you know, a challenge and something really tricky. It's really just all work in that relationship. I actually had a question about the insurance that's required. Mm -hmm. um, it, it had said somewhere, I thought I saw a note that, oh yeah, mm -hmm. um, or exemption from them. Because mm -hmm. I know, mm -hmm. I think insurance is, a, is a, a tough topic sometimes for CSAs because of our, you know, how we're actually set up. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so how, how would you get an exemption from workman's comp or disability in order to apply for this grant? So we do have folks in the program that are exempt. Um, I'm not 100% sure how they get that documentation, but I'm sure if you look at the workers' comp board website, there is some information um, on that to kind of pull from. Mm -hmm. oh, so I'm not completely like a, sure. It might be like if it's at the state level or something that you're not required to have it, then that's where your exemption comes from. Right. Am I understanding mm -hmm. that correctly? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. Can I can can I can do it? Um, like the the person who has a five hundred one three C can mm -hmm. they have more than one CSA? Can want more than one CSA use that same can do it? Mm. Yes. Um. It would just get a little bit tricky because depending on how many CSAs um, they're trying to run. Um, so we, when we do spending with this pot of funding, um, it is non-competitive. So what that means is if you qualify for the program, you're in. It's a first come first serve kind of thing. Um, so if we have a nonprofit that is uh, hosting multiple CSA sites, we can only award a certain amount of money before it turns into a different form of contract. That is not something that is a first come first serve. Then it becomes like, you know, competitive. And because this pot is not that, we wouldn't be able to. So it honestly depends on the number of um, sites that the, co that the nonprofit will be holding. Is there a cap? On the number of sites? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I would say roughly no more than three sites before we get um, a lot of questioning and right, like trying to figure out why. Mm -hmm. And and you 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 were saying that at that at that level there is another another level of funding that yeah will open up to that site. Okay, that there's another level of funding and there's another this contracting process that contract pro process is way more egregious because it's another level of funding. So the 10K is very easy for us to get out the door. Um, but when we start talking beyond that point, we're talking about contracting in Grants Gateway, doing a whole nother level of contracting that requires um, a little bit more because it's just a higher level of funding. So it requires more, um, you know, requirements in terms of qualification, in terms of paperwork and contracting and things like that. I have a question about the, um, the fiscal sponsorship mm -hmm. um, by a 501c3. Is yes. that something that like in, in the case of CSAs that aren't 501c3s, 501 c mm -hmm. themselves, which I think is most, if not all CSAs, mm -hmm. is that something that would be provided by Just Food then, or wh where would we get that from? It could be something that's provided by Just Food. I think that's something that you would all have to um, kind of consider and talk about, but it could be. Um, so typically how it works is sometimes you utilize a nonprofit partnership to assist with this process. And so, like I said, with the 501c3 status, that funding would then be held by the nonprofit. They could then subcontract with you to pay you to, you know, whatever needs to be done. However, money cannot be given from the state to a for-profit entity directly. Doesn't mean though that there can't be a partnership between 
you know, a nonprofit space that's like holding the site or, you know, doing something like that. And uh, you all or CSAs. Mm -hmm. And that would have to be something we look into because historically, I don't think Just Food has um, acted as a fiscal sponsor for CSAs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Great questions. Other questions? Or at this point, also, we, we can open it up. I'm not going to put my screen back up because it just says for, for um, uh, just open discussion, sharing best practices, q and A. I I know um, in our session a couple weeks ago, we had a couple questions about things like insurance. Um, so folks have tips on that. You know, marketing, gaining new members. So I wanted to um, open it up. And if folks have everything from Tahira, I'm thinking we could stop screen sharing because then we can mm -hmm. kind of see each other a little bit. No worries. Myself included. <laughs> just, <laughs> just only because it's hard to see everybody. There you all are. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you so, so much. I think that was a great um, overview of that program. Yes, thank um, you. Yeah, I think and it was, you it was can, very helpful. Uh, like I said, if you have any questions, if you are, you know, established a CSA in, in a certain community and you're interested in partnering with that nonprofit in your community, anything, I'm here to troubleshoot any kind of questions or things that uh, you all uh, would like to work on. Um, so thank you so much. Tarina, before you switch, there's one more mm -hmm. question. Maybe you have an answer to this. Is the 120 SNAP account fee for a one-time fee, a one-time fee yearly? I think that one is the annual fee, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so too. Mm -hmm. um, and, you, and I remember us talking about you might have some resources to share around SNAP. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So, so we, we have someone on board that does provide technical assistance to our sites when they when they get started. Um, so that will also be offered as well. Mm -hmm. Do you offer help with SNAP for people who aren't applying for a grant, just who need help with SNAP? I mean, unfortunately, SNAP no. <laughs> um, the only the only services we offer are within this. So. It's, it's a little bit complicated because our agency, Agriculture Markets, does not regulate SNAP. Mm -hmm. That would be the Office of Temporary Disability Assistance that handles all of the SNAP things. So we've kind of, because we are trying to encourage SNAP participation, have, you know, said we need somebody here to assist with this program. But outside of this program, that's not really within our purview. Mm -hmm. So to look into SNAP and EBT and what we would have to do, we'd go to the FDA website? No, the office of, which one are you looking for? Are you talking about in terms of applying for SNAP? I'm or talking just... about if we want to be able to accept, I, to accept EBT and yes. SNAP. So you will go on the USDA website, and that is within this slideshow. Um, so when you get that, you will um, see it. So you'll register with the USDA. You'll have to purchase your reader equipment, and um, you'll pretty much be set up from then. So there are some instructions here on this slide that will be sent out to you all to do that. Terrific. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure, no problem. And I know we have a number of folks on. Thank you guys again for all joining. And we've got CSA folks, we've got farmers, we've got a mix. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe, if I remember correctly, there are some of you that are accepting SNAP. So if you have any insights or good tips to share, you know, please feel free to do that as well. I think folks would um, appreciate that. Definitely. That actually covered one of the notes from last time. Oh, the other thing I was going to mention about um, paying up front is I know one thing that other CSAs have done for folks that they do have to cover weekly, whether or not they do it um, via SNAP and EBT, or if they just allow people to pay weekly, is to start a revolving loan fund. And um, that, I, I mean, I've heard folks do fundraisers to to have that just so that you have some sort of backup money so that you can pay your farmer ahead of the season, but you've got money to, until you're, um, or you've got money to pay them and then you'll get basically um, your money back as, as the season goes on from your folks that are paying weekly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do that within my CSA. So if anyone has other info on that, <laughs> and we have some 
some furry guests joining us too. Um, Kevin, you have info or you have a question? You're still muted. You're muted, Kevin. There it is. There's that unmute button. Hello, Kevin Burns from Q Garden CSA, Briarwood CSA. We have a revolving loan fund of $2,500 and we got it from CCNYC, the you know committee for the citizens of New York City. They're willing to give CSAs monies to have a revolving loan fund to take care of that very thing. Members who really want to join the CSA but can't put up that money up front. And now what you're saying today is so helpful that that's exactly the kind of thing that CCNYC would really like to see because mm -hmm. they want to expand membership. That was the idea. And to increase diversity. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering in my neighborhood, there's such an unknown because I can see this helping a CSA to grow. Like if we have 40 people, maybe it grows to 50 or 60, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's such a question mark in the region. I live in Kew Gardens, Briarwood. How many are eligible? How many would take it? You know, it's such a mystery. Mm -hmm. But I know that the green market at Forest Hills offers EBT SNAP and maybe I'll talk to them and see, you know, what the thing is because uh, it's an investment of time and energy and capacity and you don't want to wind up with one or two people you want a good number to make this you know doable but anyway i just want to jump in because the revolving loan fund monies are available from ccnyc thank you and uh, CCNYC has a, uh, a grant application now for $10,000, which is specifically Ooh. for this particular type of work that we're doing mm -hmm. around COVID um, food insecurity. So folks might want to look into it. And I also saw, um, I think it was Susan put up something about nonprofits getting um, machines um, without mm -hmm. paying for them. And that is definitely a possibility. I've, I've heard mm -hmm. that one before. So it is something for folks to, to, um, to look into as well. Just to be clear, there's a 200, it's basically $240 in annual fees to participate in SNAP. Is that what I'm gathering to hear? Um, roughly, yes. The numbers, the last time that I did this research um, was about a year ago. I haven't heard and I would have heard more if things had come down the federal pike in terms of things that have changed. So roughly, yes. Mm -hmm. And it, and there are possible ways to not um, not have to go through a whole worker um, the worker compensation issue and the workers. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to deem that you um, you know do not qualify for those uh, insurance things. So you have to deem whether you know you have an exemption from uh, those groups or not. I see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But like I said, there are folks within the program that are exempt. Um, and so if anyone has questions, I can definitely follow up a little bit more on that um, or connect you to the folks who, who are not exempt. Uh, I mean, who are exempt. The ones who are exempt mainly are, are I'm thinking one at the top of my head, is a nonprofit, um, but is operating like a community garden, like growing space. Um, so not sure under the parameters why um, she was exempt, but I know that she is. Right, because we are, we're Dutch Kills CSA and we are a nonprofit, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, we've never been able to do it because we don't have staff to collect the money. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and there, so there's a 250, you know, we just, we just offer equity shares rather than mm -hmm. undertake to collect money. Mm -hmm. So if you are, and I think I mentioned that in the presentation, if you are distributing your produce completely for free, um, then you don't have to worry about the SNAP component. We ha have gotten that this year more and more because due to COVID, of course, folks are pivoting towards um, emergency response. Um, so if you are in a model that you're set up that way, then that's perfectly fine. Well, people pay half price for the equity shares and the CSA covers the other half of the cost. Yeah, I think we will have to talk about that a little bit more in depth. Um, 
because you are subsidizing the share. However, it's still not covered under EBT. So when there is some form of money being exchanged, we would like for folks to be able to accept that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, maybe we'll follow up with you then. Thanks. This yeah. is pretty helpful. Sure. No problem. Uh, for the staff, do you have to give a 1099 at the end of the year? For this program? Yeah. Oh, not that I know of. No. Mm -mm. I would look, though, in your grants gateway registration. That may be w included within that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And like I said, Grants Gateway is helpful regardless, even if you're not interested in this program, but thinking potentially you may seek other form of state funding. Um, it's so much better to do it when you're not in an application time, you know, crunch. You're just like, hey, let me get registered because um, it allows you the time to upload all those documents and get your approval in, in place. And once you're approved, it's pretty um, solid for a long time unless you're certain documents are expiring, you may have to upload new ones. But for the most part, once you're good, you're good. I wanted to ask, is it Tony? Is that your name? Yes. Okay. Oh. Um, how do you decide what we're, we've never done a scholarship shares before and we're looking to do it how do you do if you're not using snap as a criterion how do you decide who needs who who's eligible for for a subsidized share well there are two of us on this call from dutch kill csa and amanda stellman is also involved in in our equity program we have we have criteria but because of covid we we just um we just assumed that people were asking that they needed help and we also partnered with mutual aid in Queens and um, we had a lot of people referred to us through them. Okay. And so we ended up covering half the cost of those shares and mutual aid covered the other half. So we haven't, we have criteria, but like I said, we didn't, we haven't really had to dig into it. Um, but we do have some criteria on our website or you can always follow up with me or Amanda Could about you could you tell me the website or tell us the website? It's, it's dutchkillscsa.com. Thank so, you. Yeah. Okay. And the I'll type it. I'll type it in the chat. Hi. And just to follow up on that, um, the criteria, the income criteria that we set was based on the SNAP and WIC eligibility. I think it was uh, WIC eligibility specifically. Right. And then we, we made it. We were, we raised our amounts above the WIC level. We did, yeah. So yeah. that you could even, even if you didn't qualify for WIC, you could still qualify for us um, because we at, we padded the income level by, you know, a couple hundred in most places. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I think we've captured things from the snap or from, from the chat. Um, I know one of the other things switching gears just a tad, but we can go back if, if folks have other questions. Um, folks are asking about um, um, like attracting new members, what everybody does for promotion. So I thought, you know, if folks have just one or two things, like what's your favorite way to, uh, to attract new members and get the word out about your your CSA or your farm or the farms or the CSA through the farm. Any thoughts? Oh, I see equity section on the website for Dutch Kill CSA. Yeah, go ahead, Ruth. Oh wait, I think you're still muted though. I think everybody's I have, there you okay. go. Can you hear me? Okay. So um, we we layer a number of different ways that we go about attracting new members. Uh, still, word of mouth is the most valuable. You know, people bring in their neighbors or family members because, it, you know, just that we, people can pick up someone else's share if someone's on vacation. So someone who 
picks up their neighbor's share one year, gets on our wait list for next year. We have a wait list which is very active. We keep it closed for the summer and open it right after Labor Day. And keep it. And we, um, our website pulls to it. We also, because we've been hosted in a school for 20 years, I'm not sure if we're going back this year because of COVID, but I hope so. We are able to, you know, we have deep, rich ties to the public school community. You know, we fund their PTA when we can. And that helps us because it, they're a Title I school, even though we're a gentrifying neighborhood. So that helps us bring in lower income members. Um, we also, I, you know, once or twice a season, I will post on local social media, on Nextdoor, on local parents' listservs. So there's no one way, but it's something that's in our heads, not just during the season, but 12 months a year, because that is, you, you know, that's the easiest thing is if you're constantly being aware that bringing in new members is something you have to do. The uh, Flushing CSA holds a Meet the Farmer uh, event. Uh, Several times now, it's been at the Flushing Meeting House, which is also where we're picking up our shares these days. Um, that's, but I also think word of mouth is probably the, always the best way. Great, thank you. Um, hi, it's Judy Jones. I just wanted to say that uh, we did a uh, a Zoom party for our uh, CSA back. We wanted to do a potluck dinner because we've done that in past years, and we couldn't because of the because of the pandemic. So we did it on Zoom. Played a few games. We got some gift certificates and I mean, it was the first one we did, so we didn't have a huge turnout, but hopefully we'll do, you know, maybe we'll have to do more. And, but that I think is possibly a good way to drum up members and get more people excited about CSA. Great, I see you, Kevin. Um, can I just ask one question of Judy? You might have a, you might have another comment. So was that, I'm sorry, was that for new members? Like you just recently did oh, no. that? No, or... it wasn't for new members, but people could bring people, oh. they could invite people. Uh, that's what we were oh, encouraging. Didn't happen, but we were encouraging that. I just, as an idea to throw out there. Uh, yeah. By the way, I'm Briarwood and Briarwood with Kevin. Ah. Great. Yeah, so <laughs> but it was it was well received and uh, have a couple of other of uh, our Q Gardens people on here too because we're together. Mm -hmm. It's all you, Kevin. Okay, hello, you hello everybody again. Uh, I'm trying something new this time. I don't know if it will work, but you've seen those kiosks around town, that Link NYC thing that has all that information supposedly on the sidewalk. And uh, maybe I don't even look at them sometimes, but they have a feature for local nonprofit orgs. So I didn't, I said, let me look into this. I went to the website the other day. There's something called Link Local. An org just like a CSA could online try to, you know, get them to cooperate and put something up locally on their screens in the neighborhood there. I haven't been successful in putting the whole thing together, but I'm hopeful that maybe that's just right for a CSA. It's your neighborhood. You design the picture. It's just an image that flashes with other images and keeps repeating. So it's Link NYC. The website is pretty clear and look for local link and see if it might work for you. I and just want to I just want to say we did that last year. I don't know that we got any members. And I think there was some sort of thing that I don't think you're really allowed to sell stuff. Um, and, but somehow they let us do it anyway. 
Yeah, I don't think you can use the Link NYC to sell things, but they did they did run it in uh, at, on two locations for us around sign up time last year. Great. Other thoughts? I know technically we're at time and um, the folks of us that uh, were putting this together from Just Food, um, Cheryl and Sia uh, and I had said we could stay over if folks want to. I know it's it's been a long day and you know you may want to bail, but if you would like to stay on, you're more than welcome to. Um, thanks, Liam. I saw your note. Um, I do want to put in one little uh, plug for the Just Food Network and then Shan, I'll, I'll hop over to you. <laughs> um, the Just Food Network, which I don't think we talked about on this call, and I know some of you, especially longstanding members, um, are, are aware of it, that we have our, our value chain map, and we're working on updating all of that as we do every spring. Um, so you'll see a, a survey questionnaire come out again soon, but we're also going to be putting out our request for um, the funds for that. So you'll see that come through on emails pretty soon. And folks that aren't on the, the value chain map, that's how you get on. I think I've emailed a few of you about that because you've emailed into us. Um, so we'll be in touch, but but the big thing is the value chain map to be on there because we do get a lot of hits every month for that. And um, we'll be working with um, some of our interns to help um, promote through Just Food as, as your, you know, um, as your signups go along for the spring. So, Shan. Just to add. Just oh, to yeah, add go ahead. That. Um, so, one of the interns that I'm directly working with is going through all of the um, information to make sure it's current. So, that's another thing that's important. And to also have current um uh, hours of operation. I know during COVID, it impacted a lot of the um, people on the value map. And so it was hard to keep, you know, accurate information. So then we end up getting phone calls around it. And so it really helps for us to have the most accurate information so that these people can go out to your, um, you know, con connect with you guys with your CSAs and farmers markets, et cetera. And that information, oh, sorry, one second. And that information is on, would be updated through the uh, the Google form that we send out, the little questionnaire that we send out in the spring. So um, that'll be soon. Um, Karen or Karen, do you have it relating to this? Otherwise, um, I it, think- It was actually relating to a comment in the chat. So um, I, I can wait or- <laughs> let's let's go to Shan first and then we'll we'll hop back to that and okay. I'm, 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 I'm about to expire <laughs> so no I just want to make one more comment about um about publicizing your CSA we find that even though we haven't we haven't done it yet this season we find that every year that if we put up flyers in our buildings with the little tear-offs um, and in some years we've, we've done uh, a QR code, you know, that you can scan with your phone. Um, we, we find that we reach a lot of people that way. Because even though our buildings don't have a lot of movement, there's, there are always people moving in and out. And um, I think because, especially this past year, everyone has been staying either completely at home or close to home, that um, it's, it's worth a try. Great, thank you. Yeah, um, very good ideas. Uh, where did I go? Is it Karen or Karen? Oh, uh, hi, it's Karen. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Karen Patterson. Um, I, with Judy and Kevin's help, I've been able to get a CSA off the ground in Richmond Hill, Queens, and I'm I'm really excited about it. Um, we're partnering with Garden of Eve. So it's nice to meet you all. Um, I have a question. Ruth put in the chat that she's, uh, or, or their, her CSA has worked with the local library. And I was wondering if she could elaborate on that because I, I went to my local library and um, 
they said I wasn't allowed to hang anything up <laughs> or post anything. So I, I just wanted to get an idea of um, what she was able to do and, and any other suggestions about, I mean, obviously we're talking here about where to share and post, you know, and advertise the CSA, but I'm, I'm very eager to get as many subscriptions as possible so we can get this off the ground. Thanks. Uh, they, our library did, this is the Brooklyn Public Library. I know Queens is different. Um, they did allow us to put up flyers and we've done that occasionally. We also, we buttered them up starting a few years ago. We, one of our very successful events was a cookbook swap at the end of the season where we just said to members, hey, everybody's got extra cookbooks, let's just bring them in at distribution, leave some, take some. And it was mind-bogglingly popular. But we had leftovers at the end of that, so we donated them to the local library and we put a bookmark in each of the cookbooks with our CSA information. And they had them available at a free cook at a free book giveaway that they held. So this is obviously not something that's happened during COVID, but um, it helped us make friends with them. And um, they have been really great about letting us put up flyers about, you know, we, we run their events and our social media when we think of it, which is not always that we do. And I think that they would be willing to, um, in their monthly newsletter, if we found ourselves needing members to put, to run something about the CSA. So it's sort of an ongoing partnership where we just make sure they know we're out there. I, I don't know if that's helpful, but. Yeah, it makes me think maybe I, I, Maybe I'll talk to the children's librarian, or I may have caught the wrong person. Um, so I'll I'll try again. <laughs> yeah, I and I can mention the great precedent that the Brooklyn Library has. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. I was thinking, yeah, if you meet, if you talk to the head librarian, and then even like I like the idea that Ruth said about having the little bookmarks. They're not gonna. They they'd probably be open for you to leave that for whatever COVID's participation in the library is now to leave like bookmarkers for free you know with the with your CSA information on there and again talking to the head librarian because I know in other things that I've done the libraries have been pretty cooperative about community type of you know helping support community um, ventures so that's that's great to hear thanks I actually did a modified cookbook swap because I wanted to do, I think I may have heard it from you or someone before doing a cookbook swap within the CSA, but then COVID hit because this was just, you know, a year ago, I was thinking about it. But what I did was I still had cookbooks I wanted to get rid of. So I made a list of them and sent them out to our CSA members and just on our Google group and said, hey guys, does anyone want these? And then I just left them at distribution for other people to pick up. But I am happened to be at my distribution most of the time. So it wasn't a big deal, but um, just an idea. If, if a little bit more community engagement than we can, you know, I feel like every little bit that we can connect a little, a little more is helpful, so. Any other questions, thoughts, comments, concerns? Go ahead, Ruth, you're unmuted again. Um, has anybody had any success with the Parks Department as far as locating a CSA there? Well, once again, it, uh, it's Denise from Dutch Kill CSA, and we were in a Parks Department Recreation Center, but we're not uh, and have not been since COVID started. So our recreation center is being used as a school now. So, um, you know, we've been nomadic somewhat. Mm -hmm. As are we. Yeah. yeah, and I haven't heard of any that I know of. Um, isn't, I don't know, is Greenpoint Williamsburg here? Because they are 
in McCarran Park, just inside one of the entrances, and I was a member there years ago, there was some nice parks person who looked nicely on, on them. But it was so risky and precarious because I understand the policy is no CSA. They don't like us. For some reason. They're afraid of trucks or something. Yeah. I think there may also be um, issues with vending, and it could be construed as sales or for profit. So um, it, if you do reach out to parks, maybe the, the way that it's a, approached or characterized might make it uh, more palatable to them because there's this concern about using public space for profit. Um, that, that's something that we've dealt with during all the years that we've been at a Department of Education site where it's in our yearly permit that we are not allowed to do direct selling, which is fine because we don't do direct selling. But um, parks are tough not to crack, from what I can say. They are, and for us, the issue was always that the higher up in the parks management you get, the, the less they like CSAs. And so mm -hmm. we had a good relationship with the facility where we were, um, but we were, we've always been at risk of being kicked out because of supervisory decisions. Um, and, we, and we were never allowed to exchange money at our facility. So it, we, we sell extras and sometimes people would wanna like buy a box of strawberries, but you know, they'd have to pay pie check or something like that because we couldn't exchange money. I was going to ask, does that not changing money also include like EBT if somebody was paying by EBT or is it just like direct cash? Or maybe you didn't run into that situation. I think it is a cash situation, although you're making me scared <laughs> with the idea if we ever did get oh, EBT, no. that could be very bad if we ever get back to our site. With the Department of Education, it's cash. So our, our farmer actually has EBT. We have people filling out vouchers on the site, but that isn't really an issue from what I can see. Another facility you might want to consider is looking at some of your local daycare centers because you have, I've done some work with some Head Start programs and with the CSA. And so you have parents right there, kids, all that kind of stuff for additional members, but also sometimes the, at least for the one that I was participating in, the Head Start centers allowed them to have it as a pickup place. And it works mm -hmm. great because the parents are coming there every day to pick up the kids. So like on, I think like once a week or every two weeks, however they set it up on a Friday, the parents would get their share. Uh I just wanted to say that there was a time when more people in the city council were members of CSAs. And that's, I think, a key of getting people to understand who and what we are and what we do. I remember Speaker Quinn, remember Quinn years ago, she was a member of one of the CSAs in Brooklyn. That helped us. Little problem, get in touch or we have our backing. The local politicians need to know who we are. They need to be invited and they should participate. Why don't our leaders of our communities, you know, support and boost? And I wish, you know, the city council is changing now. Maybe some of the new city council people should be approached. I think we need to maybe as a group and as Just Food, convince the leaders, the electeds, the selecteds, that CSA is an, as important as the green markets. And they seem to, you know, be more in favor. So... I actually, I agree completely. I have, for the last, for these last two years that we have not been able to get back to our regular site, I've been talking with someone in our city council member's office. He's been extremely helpful because they have funds to disperse. Last year, we were able to be cited at a nonprofit that our city council member had given funds to to help them over the, tie them over COVID closures. And I, this year, he's also been enormously helpful as we look for a new site. So I would agree completely. I, city council, they know a lot. And 
the people, not necessarily the council member, but the people who work in those offices, they are really tapped into the community. Those are excellent points. Um, and as Kevin alluded to, in case folks aren't aware, my rough estimate, I think it's it's like 35 out of the 59 city council member seats are up for election this year. So there's going to be, and a lot of those are term limited. So there's going to be changes. So especially if, you know, you know, folks that are running, you have your favorites already, support, support, reach out to them. That's a, that's a fantastic idea. I love that. Um, okay. So we're at over our time, we said we'd, we would go 15 minutes over. <laughs> and I thank you all for joining. This is always a great discussion. We were trying to help, you know, folks, because I know it's been a struggle, especially with uh, COVID. And um, we're, we're so happy, you know, that you can still have your seasons, even though they're modified. Um, and Kevin, I see your one note about discussing the pros and cons of a 501c3. So maybe folks that are 501c3s, you guys can connect, or we can try and do another another thing. I'm not actually sure, and most of you are on video, raise hands. How many are, are 501c3 um, CSAs? Denise? And that's it, it looks like. Yeah, we're not, we're not either. So um, maybe we can have another discussion. I know, I know Kevin and Denise, you are both on the, on the Google group. So you could always reach out there too. That might be a good, a good, Thing to put out there and maybe we can have another discussion sure okay great well with that i will thank all of you very very much for all of your excellent comments participation thoughts you know dedication um i'd also like to thank cheryl and sia from the just food board as well and um, if folks are you know, more interested in Just Food, we are looking for advisory committee members. I know we've already had one other person on this call that we're going to uh, talk with a little bit more. So um, yeah, just reach out to us. I think you all have our email. I didn't even put it up. It's advisory at justfood.org. Um, and many of you have my email, the Manishta76 at Gmail. So anytime, let me know. And thank you again. And I will release you to your, to the rest of your evening. Thank you all.